Thanks so much for being here. My name is Jennifer Seiner, and I just have the honor of welcoming you to the panel. And in a minute, I'll be turning it over to Miyota, who will do the actual introductions of our panelists. Um, this is the panel Necessary Risks, a conversation about race and representation in art. And I'm glad you could join us this afternoon. Um, this panel is being sponsored by three different groups, including the Utah Humanities Council, with a special shout out to Willie for all the work that he's done in organizing. Also, the Center for Intersectional Gender Studies and Research at Utah State University. And then finally, the English Department at USU as well. And I'm a member of that department and uh, happy to be with you guys today. So I want to make sure we have lots of time for conversation and sharing. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I want to introduce Nyanta uh, Chaudhary. She is a first generation Bangladeshi permanent resident in Utah. She's a queer Muslim artist, activist, writer, and research scientist. She's also the current School of Graduate Studies Senator here at Utah State University and the current president of the International Student Council. Her work on the Senate and the Executive Council, her doctoral research and her art all focus on social justice, mental health, civic engagement and the diaspora experience. In her free-ish time, she plays with her cat Kit Kat and dreams of one day going back to Dhaka to eat kachi biryani. So I am very happy to introduce Nyonta to all of you and she will take it from here. Hi everyone. It's really nice to be here with you all. And um, I'm really privileged to be able to moderate this event today. I've been meaning to meet um, Paisley, Jackie and uh, Natasha for a very long time now. And I really enjoyed reading um, your books. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, just a quick overview, in this panel discussion today, um, which is called Necessary Risks, a conversation about race and uh, race and representation in art, we are going to have, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in the, from the Facebook event, um, but a quick description. We have Paisley Rectal, who is the Utah Poet Laureate. She will reflect on her latest book, Appropriate, a Provocation, a work that considers the thorny issues around cultural appropriation. She is also joined by poet and memoirist Natasha Sahe, whose book Terror, Terror focus, focuses on the immigrant experience in relation to ideas of place and Jacqueline Balderrama, poet and author of Now in Color, a multi-generational exploration of the Mexican-American experience. The conversation promises to be urgent, complex, and grounded in the way the literary arts create unique spaces for such investigations. The three books that we will focus on today um, by these authors, um, I'm going to give you all a quick description of that as well. Natasha Sahe, so first I'll give you a quick uh, bio of our authors. Natasha Sahe is the author of three books of poems, including Vivarium. Um, a chapbook is forthcoming this summer from Diet, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, edi editions. Windows and Doors, a poet reads literary theory, a postmodern poetry handbook, um, which was published in 2014 by the University of Michigan Press. Trinity University Press published Terror, um, which we're going to be looking at today, um, which is a memoir and essays in, that was published in 2020. Sahe teaches at Westminster College in Salt Lake City and in the Vermont College of Fine Arts MFA in Writing Program. Jacqueline Balderrama is the author of Now in Color, which is what we're going to be focusing on today, and the chapbook Nectar and Small, Finishing Line uh, um, Press 2019. Finishing Line Press 2019 is when it was published by that press. She serves as a poetry editor for Iron City Magazine and has been involved in the Letras Latinas Literary Initiative, the ASU Prison Education Program, and the Wasatch Writers in the Schools. Her poems have appeared in Poet Lore, Blackbird, New Ohio Review, among others. Currently, she's pursuing a PhD in literature and creative writing at the University of Utah. And finally, we have Paisley Rectal, who is the author of a book of essays, The Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, The Hybrid Photo Text Memoir, Intimate, and Five Books of Poetry, um, which are called A Crash of Rhinos, Six Girls Without Pants, the invention of the kaleidoscope, Animal Eye, a finalist for and the, a finalist for the 2013 Kinsley Tufts Prize and winner of the UNT Rilke Prize, 
again, sorry if I mispronounced that, and Imaginary Vessels, finalist for the 2018 Kingsley, um, sorry, and the continuing legacy of Vietnam. A new collection of poems, Nightingale, which rewrites many of the myths in Ovid's The Metamorphoses, was published spring 2019 and appropriate a provocation which we're going to be looking at today and that examines cultural appropriation is and that's available now from ww norton um in feb 21. she was the first guest editor for best american poetry um, in 2020. this event is sponsored like um, jennifer mentioned by the utah humanities council the utah state university english department and the center for intersectional gender studies and research at utah state university um, so I have some specific questions for our authors that um, came to my mind when I was reading the books because, uh, first of all, the books are just so brilliant and it's really incredible. It was an incre incredible experience for me kind of reading the three of them um, back to back um, because they all kind of have like different lenses and perspectives that they shed on um, identity, intersectionality, and um, and also appropriation. So it was also interesting reading the other two books through the lens of kind of what I learned from appropriation. Before I jump to those questions, I kind of want to open up the platform for our panelists and um, have you all talk a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to write the books that we're going to be talking about tonight. And from my, from what I'm seeing, um, on the on zoom i will just go with who i'm seeing first jacqueline balderama would you like to um start hi i'd be happy to um so i'm jackie thank you so much for having me uh i will be reading a little bit from now in color and this project was basically coming to terms with my mexican-american heritage i'm third generation mexican-american my great great grandfather came on my father's side, uh, came into this country during the Mexican Revolution, um, fleeing the violence. And the book basically looks at that identity and also intersections with assimilation, as well as um, thinking through a bit about how the development of film was also influencing ideas of representation at the time. So I'll just take five or so minutes to read a few poems from the collection. Um, and then turn it back to you. Uh, again, thanks for having me. So I'll begin with the first, uh, with this poem, um, and it basically looks at the ways in which uh, during the Mexican Revolution, there was documentary and Hollywood filming going on um, and kind of using, I guess, the agreement that Pancho Villa made with this, this uh, Hollywood company at the time to allow for filming that that footage was then sort of spliced together with reenactments uh, to create this sort of uh, biography documentary drama. Mexico as Mexico, 1914. Mexican soldiers of the Revolucion play their shades through Hollywood cameras. Ray, charcoal, ash, slate for the life of General Villa except the bullets are real and there's nothing special about effects. Battles set during daylight mean you can see when a man falls, the orchestra moves on without him. In one recovered reel, a rag threads through the shrapnel hole in someone's leg. In others, the backstory filmed in California where a young Villa rears a trick horse, spinning the way it will in birth of a nation. The rest melts to silver drops. But you're asking for one quarter of my blood and for a footfall on the southern border. Before my father was born and my grandfather too. Before his father worked in the shipyards and in the orchards. And for someone who looks like me but isn't. You must rewind this place to know it was post the outlaw's revenge. Post the raid on Columbus, New Mexico, 1916, when the original footage was recast as hero turned bandit. And somewhere between here and Satevo, my ancestors escape the way steam rises from fire. Relato. Rey, 
la, to, noun, feminine. Fragments underwater and distant gleam like starfish, sure to dry into brittle, pale selves. I've learned to collect what's scattered, learned to set them here on the chance odd ends whisper. Um, so it was shared that this was sort of a multi-generational approach to thinking about identity. And in putting this book together, um, I was having interviews with my grandfather who served in the Merchant Marines at the time of World War II. And so there's a few poems that speak to his experience uh, and this is one of them. Santa Catalina. When the wealthy flee Catalina, you move in along with anti-aircraft guns, observation towers. Still, the buffalo brought for a movie they were never in go on living their lives. No one's worried that after so many reinventions, the island might finally roll over and swim away. Feral cats roam its city, feral goats the sunny brush. From excavation, remnants of fishers and traders signal they too paddled to its shores. Now you learn to unload cargo in the harbor, others not trousers for use as flotation, and maybe this will save them from the deep curtain of kelp, its flickers of light and gaping chasm. I learn some hotel rooms were converted to barracks, but you say you were in a wooden hut with three others and never swam through inflamed water. In that hut, sunk in the shadows of early winter, the four of you listen to murmurs and light footsteps on damp leaves. One fellow asks, what are you? He means, why are you brown? He says, aren't you ashamed of it? Water, 2014. Their homes have melted in the crossfire. Children bring water as much as they can carry. From Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico. That same week, over a thousand children have crossed. Coyotes pointing them toward border patrol, then disappearing the way they came. It might mean relatives, court dates, or untreated cold cement floors on which to sleep. At night, relics of the desert are socks, medicine boxes tires dragged over one's footprints. A prayer hinges on the wings of a gilded flicker foraging the ground for ants. In migrations which ended here, an interview of checked pockets, discovered bones are held at the morgue for questioning. They had found the blue capped water by a crisote bush, promised colored caps of full gallons, azul for water, rojo for juice, sticking up from beneath the desert floor, but someone had uprooted them and stabbed the plastic. Rueda. Rueda, noun, feminine. To make pinwheels and paper rosettes, I'm told to begin with squares and rectangles, folding edges into the center. They spin as if they've forgotten this origin of steps. We too forget our feet. And I will end with another Hollywood poem. Um, and this one's called Study of Self-Portrait. I hate that I love transformation montages. The Arctic fox sheds its brown fur for the winter promise. Testing the snow, it dives again and again to color beneath. Here is before, here fast forwarding to the smile. The actress fills in her brows. She is the artist and the canvas enough to select a new name. We hope we're all as pretty underneath, all American sweethearts. And then do most stop asking, where, 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 soft sirens are you from? Rita Hayworth never televises her first true makeover. Neither does she pick her name like a fruit. She revises it to her mother's, adding a Y for sounds always intended. Rewind to Margarita Carmen Cancino. Imagine editing yourself. Reconcile that after a hit, they'll still place you in B movies. That after marrying a prince, you'll still be lonely in crowds. 
or rewind the queen of technicolors, Maria Africa Gracia Vidal. Remain, become, remain, become, remain, become. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was so beautiful. I, I mean, I really appreciated listening to all of it. And but one thing, one of the lines that really stood out to me as you were speaking was, um, "What are you? Why are you brown? And aren't you ashamed?" I feel like for a lot of us, for people of color, that just hits home so just, I don't know, so accurately, I feel like, because so there's whiteness on the one hand and then Americanness. And when you combine that, I feel like every, whenever you define Americanness in America, that's defined in terms of whiteness or white Americanness. And that's what the norm is, right? Or that's what the de default is supposed to be. So when you don't fit that kind of description, because of your visible features, um, yeah, that's uh, you. You just that's you're you're just deviating from what the default is, and your whole identity is questioned. Um, yeah, that's just something that I don't know. I'll always think about. So thank you. Um, we have up next Paisley Rectal. Um, Paisley, would you like to talk a little bit about um, just yourself and your past books as well as? Um, just what, what inspired you to write provocation and what your experience was of it. Thank you. Um, I was also really moved by Jackie's reading. And in fact, that's one of the, um, I changed my reading a little bit to kind of go with hers. Um, so I've written enough, <laughs> a lot of books about race and identity in many ways, but it was an editor who actually approached me to uh, write a book about cultural appropriation and literature, which was a pretty terrifying, uh, proposition. So um, I'm just going to read a very short section from this uh, called Under the Chapter, Understanding the Complexities of Race and Identity. At heart, the risk with turning race into a metaphor is that it can essentialize racial identity. It suggests there must be something authentic and unchangeable about our bodily differences, an argument that has been ironically shared by both segregationists and racial progressives alike when they demand we each stay in our lanes. A phrase I find particularly bemusing because as a third generation Asian American woman who is racially half Chinese and half white, where exactly am I supposed to drive? Perhaps I can choose to categorize myself as Asian American or as Chinese American or both, but I might also choose to see myself as mixed race. Perhaps based on my white reading appearance to certain observers, I might identify myself culturally only as white, but why should I identify myself according to other people's perceptions? And if I do categorize myself as mixed race, what could possibly constitute a mixed race culture outside of my appearance, itself hardly shared with other mixed race people? Do I have any claim outside of the differences of my physical appearance to a Chinese cultural identity, especially as I do not speak the language, rarely cook Chinese food at home, do not live in an enclave with other Chinese descended people, and am only mildly inconvenienced by my family's watered down Confucian values? At the same time, regardless of my paternal family lineage, can I believably claim to be any part Norwegian? And what exactly is Norwegian supposed to mean when I was born and raised in America? If culture is defined as a group that possesses a distinct set of physical features, a specific language, religious practice or food, arts and music, and that is bound by geography or the same set of moral, political, familial or ethical values, you can see how much variation and even contradiction exists inside what you and I might tr offhandedly treat as a monolithic group, such as African Americans or LGBTQI people. Even highly specific group identities, such as Navajo or Pakistani, might seem at first more clearly bounded by a set of shared values and customs, but they too quickly become more complex constructions as these cultures do not live in isolation. Like any other cultural group, they change over time. And of course, they come into contact with people from all over the world through marriage, migration, adoption, and assimilation. Obviously, one of the reasons I found my lane difficult to navigate is that my racial identity is not my cultural one. The terms culture and race intersect in our imagination since these terms have been interchangeably used and conflated. It's largely understood by biologists that race is a social construct that groups people together based on the similarity of physical appearance and features while ethnicity refers to one's cultural affiliation. Occasionally, race and ethnicity share some connection, as with Chinese Americans who also choose to consider themselves Asian American. But sometimes race and ethnicity are different, 
is when a black woman born in Italy identifies herself as Italian and also black. You can be many different ethnicities at once, Mormon, American, and Navajo, say, but it's harder for people to accept that you can be multiply raced. This is because racial definitions are imposed on us due to appearance, while ethnicity can be based on personal choice. You can learn a different language, convert to a religion, eat different foods, but you can't unless you're Rachel Dolezal suddenly claim to be black. Ethnic identity may be both internally and externally constructed too, as in the example of Latinx or Hispanic Americans who may be seen as comprising a single monolithic cultural group defined by appearance, but who quickly identify themselves according to more specific cultural groups, such as Mexican Americans or Colombian Americans or Cuban Americans. And of course, these cultures break down further based on indigeneity, geographical affiliation, migration, and language. We all rely on the shorthand of racial and cultural identity, even as we also recognize the limitations of this way of thinking about ourselves. While our identities are fluid, some part of cultural belonging can always be definitively answered through citizenship or clan and tribal membership records. But outside of this historical record keeping, the question of who we are remains tantalizingly out of bounds. The cultures are defined by shared beliefs and traits. Once I find someone who possesses the traits I define as essential to her culture, I will just as quickly find someone within that culture who defies or lacks those same traits and abilities. And as cultures change over time, I have to change my ideas about what should comprise those traits and abilities. That's why, as you might recall, so many people were offended by Elizabeth Warren's DNA test to determine whether she was Cherokee. Culture isn't in the blood, it's performed. And with American Indians, it's also about being claimed. To insist that DNA gives us our identity is both fetishistic and essentialist. If every culture had a universally approved essence, then writing outside my subject position would be easy because I could know the limits of the representation. This is what it means to be Tlingit. That is what it means to be Guyanese. I bring all this up to point out how much you might be overlooking in our discussion of cultural appropriation if you and I simply treat this as a questionable artistic practice. I wanna trouble any assumptions we might have about race and culture, which includes the belief that culture and race are tied to specific easily categorized and immutable identities that can be performed on the page, the use of symbols or virtue signaling. Maybe you already know that, but if you and I know race is not something that can be essentialized, why have we turned race into such a powerful metaphor in our literature? The answer to that lies deep in the enlightenment when starting in 1735, Carl Linnaeus created human racial categories in a systema naturae, attaching specific characteristics to races he termed white, yellow, red, and black. Linnaeus's taxonomy served as the backbone of Europe's social coding and imagination of race, in which race became the, what the scholar Henry Louis Gates called a trope of ultimate irreducible difference between cultures, linguistic groups, or adherence of specific belief systems. Race became the ultimate trope of difference because it was so arbitrary in its difference. Ironically, because race can't biologically uphold or explain differences in our innate characteristics, racism must be supported by increasingly subjective rules of difference, including what Gates calls a careless use of language that we deploy to maintain those differences. It's this careless figurative language that is essentially willed or reified natural differences in between people into formulaic ones. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Katy Perry, dressed as a geisha, performing her hit song unconditionally for the 2013 American Musical Awards. If you've seen the performance, you'll remember that Perry was dressed as a geisha in pink and white, her stage filled with cherry blossom branches, red lacquer bridges, taiko drummers, and black haired girls all dressed in yukata while twirling paper fans. The only thing missing was Scarlett Johansson dressed as Hello Kitty, practicing karate in a corner. The problem with this performance wasn't that Perry took material objects from Japan as stage props, but that her performance invested these objects with racial difference itself. Perry's decision to dress as a geisha while singing a song about loving someone unconditionally linked Japanese characteristics and culture with unalterable devotion, an orientalist trope of the submissive Asian female that's existed since the late 19th century. Perry's appropriation darkens the meaning of unconditionally, a song whose lyrics declare only that the singer will adore her lover regardless of his insecurities. Her costume and stage visuals were meant to evoke the sad end of Madama Butterfly, in which Koko-san kills herself after discovering her American lover has been faithless. 
If Perry had been singing another song and worn a kimono, that would have been appropriative, but it wouldn't have crossed the line into racism. Her performance in Japanese clothing visually argued that the most effective way of proving her undying devotion to a lover was by displaying herself as a Japanese woman, because that's how Asian women love. And that, X, is a perfect example of harmful cultural appropriation. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Paisley. Oh, again, that was super beautiful. Um, and it just it just makes me think of so many different things or so many different ideas as well as so many different life experiences, as I'm sure um, for our 30 audience members, probably a lot of people can relate as well. Now um, we have Natasha Sahe. Um, Natasha, if you um, could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what inspired you to write your book as well as your past writing experiences? Thank you. Thanks, it's nice to be here with you all. Um, I started to write terroir as a foodoir because I like to write about food and I'm a good cook and I'm interested in food. So I had hundreds of pages of small sort of stories about recipes and stories about food. And, and then I realized that there were deeper, larger issues that I could not write about, that I needed to write about, but could not write about at the same time as I was writing recipes. So then this uh, project veered into a more traditional memoir in essays. Um, I was born in Germany of parents displaced by World War II, and at the time, my father was stateless. My mother was a German citizen, although she too had lost her homeland uh, because she was from Silesia. But my father was stateless. And uh, German law at the time meant that um, it was so patriarchal that I was stateless. Uh, I could not become a German citizen. My father did not want to become a German citizen. He had fought against Germany in the Second World War. Um, so he applied to uh, emigrate to the U.S. and that was his first choice and he got it and we went uh, when I was two. I grew up in New York and New Jersey and learned English from mostly TV because we continued to speak German at home. Uh, so I'm going to read an excerpt from Terroir that patches together uh, some thinking about race. So this takes place in the late 70s, early 80s, mostly. I met my husband, Tyrone, while I was working as a waitress in the Washington Hilton Hotel. That was the hotel where Reagan was shot, you might remember. And 18 months later, we moved in together. I have an indefinite answer to the question, where are you from? So did Tyrone, who came to London from Jamaica to join his parents when he was 15. At 16, he'd finished mandatory schooling. With his talent for imagining and then building structures, he could have been an architect or a sculptor, but he was also dyslexic and a working class black immigrant. That meant a job. He wanted to see the world and the only opening in the British Merchant Navy was for a galley boy. Eventually, the Navy sent him to cooking school twice, and he climbed the ranks to executive chef, usually the only black man on a ship. On these ships, he learned that white men liked to call him Terry, an English nickname. In South African and Australian ports, police assumed he was indigenous and roughed him up, even jailing him, until his white shipmates retrieved him. With the Navy, he'd spent time in Houston, Los Angeles, and New York, so he was under no illusions about the US. But since the advent of container shipping, the interesting weeks in exotic ports turned into stopovers of a mere 24 hours. Because of cousins in Washington, DC, Tyrone eventually landed there and undocumented started over again as a line cook. 
My friends noted Tyrone's charm, saying, he doesn't have a chip on his shoulder like American black men. I repeated this myself until I realized how wrong it was. Putting nationality ahead of skin color was a way to not confront my own internalized racism. The questioning of Kamala Harris's identity is another example. As the daughter of a Jamaican father and Indian mother, she was accused by alt-right commentator Ali Alexander of not being a Black American, despite being born and having grown up in the U.S. In other words, parsing the fine points of any person of color's identity is a maneuver that lets racism win. White Americans don't react the same way to Black people who are not Americans. Our guilt is distanced and abated, and we aren't made to admit our dominance. Tyron had his legacy of growing up in Jamaica and the UK, from traveling around the world, from living in the US, and even from his own family. His mother often praised his younger brother's beautiful light skin. She expressed that bias, and I expressed mine by emphasizing Tyrone's foreignness. His accent marked him as an immigrant, and it sometimes gave him a pass in American culture in the way that Angela Davis was treated with respect when she spoke French in a shoe store in her hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. By focusing on nationality instead of race or power, we seek opportunities to ignore inequity. Tyron and I rented a four room row house in Southeast DC. I was the only white person on the block. On Sunday mornings, the retired couple across the narrow street put speakers in their upstairs windows and broadcast gospel radio sermons into our house. I closed the windows and wore earplugs. My suburban aunt visited once in the daytime noting the plastic chrysanthemums in neighbors' windows boxes, window boxes as if she were doing an anthropological study. My surgeon was black, she said. Then she paused. But a cook? My parents never visited. Monthly phone calls began pleasantly. Then my mother handed the phone to my father and the call ended with one of us angrily slamming down the handset. Go ahead, I said when he told me he was leaving his money to the Baptist home down the road. My parents didn't care about religion, so the detail was almost funny. Yet disapproval smoldered through the wires like burnt garlic. The row house we rented was owned by a legal secretary who speculated in real estate, hoping to fund her retirement. A white woman in her 40s, our landlady bought and was renovating another house on Capitol Hill. Built in 19, ours had been cheaply updated. All the windows, even the bathroom skylight, had bars, which Tyron asked the landlady to remove. He told me he felt like a caged animal. She said, why don't you wait a few weeks and then let me know. Upstairs, the pistachio and brown shag carpeting was three inches high. Downstairs, ebony stained wood floors, exposed brick walls, and the original working fireplace gave the space charm. We placed Tyrone's Argentinian sword on the mantel and under it his carved wooden statue from Thailand, African drum, and collection of jazz LPs. I had the notion that if a single white woman could live on D Street, so could we. In high school and college, I was taught to treat the history of US slavery and racism as a parallel track for a train I did not need to board. I watched it with the disorienting feeling that I was moving, but when it passed, I was standing still. 40 years ago, I thought that the color of Tyrone's skin made him more likely to be accepted on D Street, and my choosing him was a, quote, get onto D Street free card. I'm chagrined to admit that I thought I had proven my lack of racism merely by living with Tyrone. I was vaguely aware that some black men internalized their racist preference for white standards of beauty and chose women as trophies, but our relationship, relationship still felt like a victory over racism. It was a victory with a hollow center because, 
and I didn't know this then. No matter what I did or said, I profited from the racial power inequity in our culture. I didn't know enough about history to understand why our, grand, uh, why our neighbor might be raising her grandchild, like Tyrone's mother raising hers. And I didn't think about what it meant to be part of a community, not just tolerated, but trusted, the person you might ask to feed your cat. I didn't try to be that person on D Street, not because I hadn't watched my parents make friends with every one of their neighbors, but because I, ha I didn't even think to try. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Natasha. That was beautiful. Um, a quick housekeeping note that I forgot to mention earlier. So if you, if all of you look um, at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will see two ways of interacting with us. One is through the chat and one is through the Q&A. The chat is for general comments um, that you would like to make, um, either addressing the panelists or the audience or anyone. Um, and the Q&A would be for submitting your questions that you would like for me to pass on to the panelists to answer. Okay. So now that we have heard a little bit from all of you, all three of you regarding your books, I would love to jump in and just pick out some stuff that stood out for me as I was reading them. My first question would be for Paisley. Um, uh, your work focuses, emphasizes a lot um, on empathy and how as a reader, it's the empathetic process of pro processing what you're reading that kind of allows you to engage with the material as well as engage with the um, writer as well. And from, you also mentioned empathy from the writer's perspective of how the writer kind of um, has to have empathetic access to the communities or the people that the writer is writing about to be able to write about it um, fluently. Two, um, two quotes that I want to mention that really stood out to me. One was from, um, I forget what uh, chapter it was, but it was page 54. Empathy may be a profound, exci profound, exciting, and beneficial emotion, but it cannot be used to justify or critically frame any work engaged in appropriation. And the other line was it, on page 153, cognitive, um, Sorry, I wrote that. <laughs> so the line is, this empathetic elision between text and reader is something he, the only, that, the, that only the reader can activate, but writers work hard to pierce that veil between self and other that also constitutes um, writer and reader. Um, I wanted to kind of learn about your own experience of writing um, because uh, in one of the chapters you mentioned your kind of cognitive dissonance of enjoying creative work that don't necessarily aren't necessarily aligned with um, your own virtues or what you consider good art I guess you mentioned mm -hmm. horror movies and um, and the vi and um, violent scenes and how even or romance novels that are really cliche and stereotypical how they do kind of activate that part of your brain where you recognize that something is problematic about this but you still do enjoy um consuming that literature so how would you say that your own sense of empathy plays into um how you create work or how you also process work created by others it's a good question and it's a complex one and i'll i'll sort of back up a a little bit by saying that I actually um, am very suspicious of empathy in general um, while I recognize it as a virtue <laughs> between people and also maybe the necessary glue that makes a classroom work well. Um, the empathetic and identification we have with other people or the attempt to feel for other people. I also recognize that empathy is something that um, is manipulated, manipulative, and something that um, allows us to really identify with performances of people. I was really struck with Jackie's reading, for instance, where there's so many, the collision of race and film and performance and things like that. And I think that gets to the heart of what I'm talking about, which is that oftentimes when we say we identify with a character, we're really not identify with a person so much as a performance on the page. And that creates a kind of, um, 
ethical tension, which is, are we really identifying with people or are we identifying with um, characters that sort of have somehow reflect what we want to believe about them back to us. So sometimes we'll have very empathetic um, reactions to characters and performances, uh, not because these are people who are essentially different from us, but because they, they reify some idea that we hold about what those people or ourselves, what we should be like too. That said, um, I also recognize that some part of reading and responding to literature is about being entertained and moved outside of what we ourselves necessarily believe in. But there are two I still have questions because sometimes um, the, the question is sort of, are we ever really fully removed from our value system? Or are we ever really fully removed from our identities? Or are we just sort of um, coming into a new corner, a new way of seeing something we already privately held, but maybe had not expressed yet? And I go back and forth on that, but I do think that that's one of the values of literature in general, which is that it asks us um, to put different ideas we might have in contention with each other. Um, and, and in some of the best forms of literature, I find not comfort, but discomfort, that kind of coming up against something that maybe I, I didn't believe or didn't want to believe. Um, and in that sense, it's not a question of empathy so much as it's a question of um, sort of a radical, imaginative recognition of difference that I think um, a lot of the best kinds of literature that is not just culturally appropriative engages in. How does it make us see the other not as a reflection of ourself that we overlay onto them, but how do we see them as separate beings that also have a famil familiarity, um, a similarity to us? So I'll stop there. And Thank you, Paisley. Um, I really love and appreciate that answer. Um, my next question is for Natasha Sahe. Um, I would, so I remember from uh, page 176, a line that stood out to me was, reviewers' opinions uh, previously had authority because of their training and reputation. Now reviewers are democratized. Um, so as I read this line, and at, in conjunction with the with um, Paisley's reading, a question that comes to mind is: What role do you think identity also plays in the in critiques um, in reviewers making it to that stage where their opinions will be validated, or even um, just your own from your own experiences with um, with uh, with your ex husband? Um, and other people of color, what have you, I guess, found um, in how your identity shapes um, how your how your opi opinions are received? Hmm. Well, I, I I think what you're asking can be answered actually by um, Paisley's book, uh, and her argument in every chapter is it depends every instance is so complex that there can be no one template um, put on them to explain. So I, I really can't answer your question because you have to give me a specific example and then I'll go into the nuances and try to explain. Uh, I'm actually writing an essay about reviewing now um, and there's um, it, it, what I have discovered about book reviewing uh, in the in the history of the U.S. is that everybody has complained about it since day one, since the first book review. Um, nobody's happy, and poetry book reviews are a, a subset of that, where the problems are highlighted and exaggerated. So in another year or so, I'll have an essay about that. And if you can come up with an, an example, then perhaps I can run it through, um, you know, it, the particulars and, and give you more, a more more specific answer. Mm, I was thinking more generally in terms of, I guess, how your process of writing this book um, kind of plays into how you perceive, um, well, this, this particular code talks about reviewers specifically, but I'm wondering more generally in terms of artists and um, 
people who do have a voice in the mainstream. Um, just your thoughts and opinions um, on how the, how that like how that plays into um, how how that work is perceived. I think that was way more general than my <laughs> than the question I had even asked at first. But if you had any general thoughts on that, but I also really I appreciate. don't have general thoughts. I don't. Okay, thank you. No, I really appreciate your answer as well. That was really lovely. So my next question is for Jackie. Um, uh, I have three different uh, lines that I kind of grabbed because I saw this, um, this theme that kind of connected them and I feel like it's a theme of death or of losing um, in a sense. The first one is, is from the poem Afterlife. Um, there's this line that says, in the cemetery we find names, symbols for different faiths. We imagine the body at rest as we're told. We imagine other traditions like other shoes. And then we have the dead dream us from, uh, that's the name of the poem. And the line that stood out for me was ghosts pass between homes, between cuts of earth, between hills and rivers, um, impressions ripping the gown of a giantess. And then the last poem is Traza on Mapa. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. When you return home, always go another way in case someone is looking for you. So now this, this, this third one, I feel like is different from the other two because it doesn't literally talk about death. But at the same time, there's this melancholy about it that is very close to death, I would say. Um, this fear of um, losing your life or fear of the unknown um, when, in case someone is looking for you. So yeah, I just wanted to like uh, hear your thoughts on how the idea of death or the idea of loss um, inspired you to write your poetry. Yeah, I, I like that you touch on this idea of melancholy and loss and death. And I mean, a lot of the book is also in tracing back, you know, my ancestry and um, you know, a lot of the experiences that I think Mexican Americans, you know, similar to my position have today is that, you know, at least for myself growing up, um, I did not grow up speaking as a fluent Spanish speaker. And so there's sort of a loss there linguistically that I really wanted to explore with this book. Um, but you're also, I mean, in sort of trailing, especially the experience of immigrants and migrants, um, you know, usually the story is, you know, you're, you're migrating for, um, for hope, for a better life. And so now that, you know, in a way, at least for my family, I'm like on the other side of that. I'm like what they had hoped for. But what is the trade off when, you know, through generations of immigrant, uh, of generations of family who have experienced, you know, pressures to assimilate or have made choices about what parts of their culture that they bring into the life that they practice or even what communities they have around them to practice their language or not, um, there is a kind of loss that I think is experienced and that I was, I guess, had an anxiety about. Um, obviously, like, I, I look a certain way. I kind of, I have faced some of those questions like, where are you from? And also like on the more privileged end of things, it's like, well, you don't speak Spanish <laughs> becomes the question. So it's sort of interesting just trying to navigate, I think the expectations that maybe people of color face or immigrants face or, you know, the current uh, generational experience. So I'm like third generation Mexican-American. It's it's ever shifting and yet there's always this idea of otherness and so at least in this book I was trying to navigate that as best I could and also come to some kind of acceptance with that as well. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so my next question would be this is kind of more of a, I would like it to be a discussion between our writers. And this one would be between Paisley and Natasha. So Paisley, you have on page 68, you talk about um, a plausible imagination of history um, in the way to describe how a lot of mainstream uh, writers, I guess, um, experience their art or write their art. Um, 
that in conjunction with, um, I remember reading at, at, um, in one of the pages, you talk about how there are gratifying descriptions that you know span pages or span paragraphs of violence. And in your case, you were describing gender violence. Um, and this was, what was it? Uh, American Dirt. William, William Stryan, um, his, um, yeah, 1967, The Confessions of Nat Turner, where you felt like a lot of the descriptions um, and adjectives that he used to portray Nat was through his racist lens. And the reason that um, there was so much emphasis on these, this, the scene where um, Nat Turner apparently imagines um, being sexually violent against a white woman, that took up a lot of just space um, mm -hmm. in, in his book. While reading that, that made me, that kind of reminded me of um, American Psycho by um, uh, Brett Easton Ellis. And from my experience of reading that book, I remember that whenever there were scenes that described uh, Patrick Bateman murdering a man, it was maybe two or three lines, or it wouldn't be more than two or three short paragraphs. But whenever there were scenes um, of violence against women, it would be literally three to four pages every single time. Um, so with, uh, I don't know, with kind of that in mind, and, um, also when I was reading terror, um, I remember there were like very short, um, adjectives to describe people, like one or two adjectives and not long, um, passages like that. Um, so a few lines, um, and I really love this chapter, um, Natasha, you talked about how, when you, um, met, um, your ex-husband and your ex-husband's boss, who invited you to their party. Um, I feel like, uh, so one thing that stood out to me was that um, the number of words used to describe the people were very just concise. Um, you described your ex-husband as the, when we first get introduced to him, uh, the a lanky black student. So it's just two words. Sorry, my cat is in the way. Um, so my question is how do you, um, which I think is good art. So how do you um, kind of maintain that balance where you um, aren't producing something like American Psycho where it's gratifying and where, you, where, where you're being measured and um, just self-aware in what you're describing? So one of the things I think I can see from your face, Natasha, you're still contemplating this question. So I'll leap in and say a few things. One of the things that, you know, is the strength of Natasha's writing is that she comes as a poet. Um, and so she doesn't have to go into, you know, long orgiastic sorts of descriptions of these things to, to get to the heart of a character. And also the heart of the character that she's describing is not meant to be a sort of traumatic um, portrayal of a, a sort of misogynist uh, display of violence, which I think that, you know, there's, in my mind, there's no ability to compare Brett Easton Ellis with what Natasha's doing because they're doing such different things. One of the reasons that Ellis is spending more time on the murder of female victims is, and it goes back to that question of empathy, which is that at some level, these depictions of violence are there to please and titillate an audience that is more primed through so many movies, other forms of media, to see women's bodies as victims, uh, to see women's bodies abused and tortured. And what Ellis is doing is displaying that for us, but not critically necessarily. And he's trying to you know, excite us. But what, what Natasha, I feel, is doing in those moments, and I'm sorry to speak for you, Natasha, but, I, but I'm just, what I think she's trying to do is get to the heart of character. There's nothing, there's nothing there to display somebody as a kind of obje an object. She's trying to give us, in the pithiest moments possible, the strongest portrayal of who they, how we can perceive them as people. But, you know, what would you say, Natasha? <laughs> well, um, one challenge always is describing skin color mm. um, because I, I talk about several black characters, including, including my husband, Tyrone's skin color, which is very dark. Uh, I think once I say chocolate, but that's a cliche. Maybe I took it out. And the way to find the best way to describe people 
for me is to have lots of readers read it and point out where I'm making a misstep. So I remember I had, um, I describe a, a friend and um, a fellow M M MA in creative writing student and I describe his skin color as caramel. And that can't, I think I do it once. And one of my readers pointed out that I did it twice. So I, I took it out. So you want to give a sense of what the person looks like. Um, but the most important thing is to let them speak, uh, not to speak for them, and also to show them in action, uh, to, to recall for, in my, in my case, it was pretty easy because I have a good memory. I was able to recall things that people said and people did. Um, so I'm not sure that that answers your question, but that's what I got. I would also like to add to that. I mean, I think as you're giving the, the practical solutions to this problem, because these are practical questions that people are finally having, like, how do you do it? One of the things that I've noticed is that, um, people will racialize people who aren't white and treat the white characters in their writing as raceless, which is to say that there are almost no descriptions of what their bodies look like. So that's one thing also to think about, which is why do some people get adjectives and other people do not get adjectives? Um, and it seems fair to me to also say, you know, like, how do we, how, if, if every, if race is something that we all have, we just have different races, you know, then why are some characters on the page racialized and others and not. Others not. Yeah. So um, I have a Utah um, Poetry Out Loud gig that starts in two, three minutes. So I'm going to have to bid you adieu. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Natasha. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> um, Thank you for the discussion. I really appreciated that. Um, also, particularly um, the last thing that you were talking about in regards to who's racialized and who's not. Um, because I, part of my, I guess, inspiration for asking this question was I noticed that um, descriptions of um, Tyron were, um, so he was described as the lanky um, black student. And then on the same page, there are descriptions of the, his boss who was described as, um, a white woman, sorry, not white, just a woman. And then um, later I, on the next page, there, was there were descriptions of um, an old man, a middle-aged man. And, though there, and none of those characters had like racial aspects to it. But at the same time, I, like I was saying, I feel like what really differentiates between or, or sets, sets, sets apart um, work that appropriates or work that brings out that racial aspect from um, my reading of this book, I would say is that just the conciseness of it, um, even though there are racialized terms, I feel like those are terms that are used to just, like you said, um, have access to that character, have uh, humanized that character versus further objectify that character. Can I just say one thing in this kind of, I'm just thinking about some of the stuff that Jackie was talking about earlier, you know, I kind of feel like I know I'm in the work of cultural appropriation when race means something other than just physical difference, right? When it when it's there to essentialize or to signal a kind of authenticity of in some direction that is in its own way unchangeable. And so, you know, if and I think this is something that actually flummoxes students who feel like if I even mention that a character in my story is American Indian or African American, somehow maybe that in itself is a racist move. I wouldn't say that. I mean, if they, if, if that is a central and important part of how we understand them as people, then, then having these details seems central. But when it starts to change from a detail to the thing itself, you know, from description to metaphor for interior difference, right? Works of cultural appropriation, I think, collapse interior qualities with um, exterior difference. And that's, I mean, as I think Jackie and I could both attest to, that's not what happens. Like <laughs> after a second or third generation, this idea of authenticity, I don't, none of us really are authentic. 
Um, and the fantasy about this authenticity is I think ult ultimately what pushes us into directions in our writing to create descriptions that insist upon realities or psychological realities that actually don't exist. I don't know, what would, what would you say, Jackie? I mean, you're, you're writing yeah. about this a lot. I mean, in performance and everything. Right, I mean, like, well, in terms of just like making choices about how to write about race. And like, there's also this question when I was even asked to, to participate in this panel, which I was super excited to, it was like race and representation. Well, I was like, well, Mexican American is technically like white. I've been filling in that bubble on like standardized tests for my whole life. So it's like this very, um, I don't know, hybridity, murky space to think about like, well, what is identity and how do you represent it? And also like, how do I represent you know, not just my own story, which I think, you know, as individuals, we have the authority and, you know, the voice to do that ourselves. But what happens when you then sort of, you know, are talking about people in your family and then people outside your family and then communities that you are in or not in. Um, and I mean, I find that it involves a lot of trial and error, like questions I, I ask in that, um, I think there's a question in the Q&A was asking which books sort of helped inform ways of thinking. And though I hadn't read this book while I was writing Now in Color, um, Susan Briante's Defacing the Monument. Yeah, that's a great book. Gave me, yeah, I, she gave me some like just handouts of like, these are the questions you should consider. Um, and some of them I had been, but others were like, oh yes, well, obviously. Um, and some of those like things to consider if, if you're thinking about writing about um, communities or people that you may be a part of, but not fully, you know, invest in that community. Like, right, I'm a Mexican American. I can't really speak specifically from first person perspective on, on the experience of immigrants. Uh, but I can think about like, well, what, what kind of accuracy am I going for? What, what's the goal of this project and how might that actually harm the people it's speaking about? How can I do this responsibly? Um, so those are a lot of the things I think about when engaging in this and sort of maintaining the space of like yeah. these, I don't know, murky, blurred identities. I'll say one last thing as you're talking, it really struck me. I love that book too. Um, and one of, there's a couple of things I was thinking as you're talking. One is we have a tendency when we're thinking about identity, again, to go back to this idea that somehow identity is a stable project and it isn't. And I think that all of us experiencing the world and race makes this much more apparent and gender makes this very apparent too. But oftentimes um, aspects of the self are elevated or suppressed based on our scenario, like certain choices. Like I always think of myself as being raced in a particular gen, you know, you know, way or gendered in a particular way based on like the options that are available to me in that moment. Like when someone says, what are you? Suddenly a whole like wall of choices comes down. Like, what does that mean? You know, and that can include everything from like Utah resident to not a, you know, foreigner, right? Like, um, so, uh, you know, that all these choices kind of, kind of scrolling down, but I think a lot of us experience that. And I think that most of, most of really good writing understands that, you know, identity when it's on the page is performed via these choices that get elevated or suppressed and how characters, you know, respond to that. I think so what, that's why Natasha said it's really important to show how people behave and what they say, because that is in fact how we express ourselves. It's not the physical thing in the end. Um, and, you know, that, that question of like, how are we responsible? Are we, how are we harming potentially the people that we're trying to represent or speak to one of the things that I find so, you know, enticing and frustrating about this question of appropriation is that you can sort of end up doing a really sensitive, uh, complex, excellent portrayal of somebody unlike you and still end up, because it's a publication system, still end up harming that community because you're the one publishing, you're the one getting the financial words, you're the one getting the voice. And so to a certain extent, like that question of harm, you'll never answer it perfectly, you know, I mean, so it really does come down to this, like, how, how passionately and how strongly do you feel that you can do this in a way that is respectful, even understanding though you can't control any of the reception afterwards? I kind of want to add to this beautiful conversation we're having about appropriation. Um, and it's mostly for, um, sorry, my head is, a mess for Jackie. <laughs> um, so there can be different 
tiers or different um, kinds of appropriation, right? Um, so we're mostly talking about cultural or racial appropriation. Um, I was curious from reading a lot of the poems, um, how much uh, how much access or um, personal experience you had with the with the events that you talked about, and I'm asking this because I have also struggled with I when I whenever I I find myself writing 90% of the time that I write poetry about the Bangladeshi War with Pakistan, mm -hmm. and I wasn't born at that time, so I don't have access to that information. So I constantly always wonder if I'm appropriating experiences of trauma or if it's not appropriation because I have emotional experiences that I can um, kind of like build on or draw from. But do I, do I necessarily have to have been present for the events that I'm discussing um, to be able to, I guess, be allowed to write about it? And um, I, yeah, I just wanted to hear from you, Jack, before. Yeah. I will, you too. Yeah. I, have I, <laughs> I will say the access I had where I used the pronoun I, I think was always about me. Um, I turned, I did do some interviews with my grandfather, so I did have some secondhand accounts from him. But the other um, information, like the experience of migrant children traveling to the border in like 2014, or, you know, even historical events, like I wasn't even born and couldn't be around for to like be there, like the 1930s Mexican repatriation program that was, you know, having these. Um, forced deportations of people of Mexican ancestry happening at the same time. So I think in terms of like feeling comfortable with what I'm writing about, I think that was a, a it was a process, um, figuring out like what is the perspective I'm taking, what kind of research do I need to do to feel at least expert enough on this individual poem. I admit that Now in Color does have like a very broad brush stroke. It doesn't go into a single historical issue at great depth. So it was a bit of juggling to decide, okay, well, how many details are necessary and how much historical context do I need to put this poem together and how much to include that for the reader? Um, I sort of reconciled with, you know, getting your facts right and also like including a notes page that sort of redirected readers if they wanted to learn more about these particular instances or you know the Pancho Villa being in this Hollywood <laughs> production in like the early 1900s like where they could find information about that. Um, had this been a different project and it was looking more closely at a precise historical event that would have meant a different sort of level of focus I think. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> I think that's a great answer to it. I mean, to a certain extent, this, I, I, there's two things I would say. The first is, um, this is why I think it's kind of important to think about breaking up the term appropriation a bit more, because I think we have this idea that appropriation is always and only bad. And to a certain extent, you know, when we are using other documents, other histories, things outside of our immediate experience, um, and adapting them, that is a form of appropriation, but that does not necessarily mean it's bad. Um, I think I want to make a distinction between um, sort of a documentary poetics, uh, works of adaptation and homage, and say that those are potentially fundamentally quite different than cultural appropriation, which is absolutely about trying to sort of use these appropriative literary techniques to potentially reify a hierarchical racist system. And, you know, sometimes, you know, one work unconsciously does the other one, but I think a lot of times it does not, in fact. And it's important to recognize that. And the other thing I'd want to say is that um, I think if we get to such a point where we believe that history can only be owned by the very people who experience that history, we're going to be a, a global group of amnesiacs because, you know, somehow this history has to travel. Somehow these narratives have to be shared and they will always be shared and transmitted at some point by someone who did not personally experience that. Journalism works fundamentally on that principle. So, um, and, and, you know, I think so we have to be a little bit more generous, I think, uh, with ourselves and with other artists to at least be exploring that. Doesn't, that doesn't give us an automatic right. It doesn't automatically mean that the thing we produce is going to be good. But I do think we have to take 
some sense of um, empathy around that question, which is how do we all create and hold historical memory so that it in fact gets shared by more people. So we do have one more question. And if you have any other uh, businesses to attend to, feel free to leave. I don't want to hold anyone on back. But the question is something I've been struggling with recently is giving people of differing social experiences representation in my writing without accidentally doing them wrong. I'm white. I don't want to perpetuate the white narrative, but I also don't want to misrepresent people either. How should I navigate this? And that would be, that's our only question, so it would be our last question. <laughs> so we have to answer it. Okay, well, <laughs> I, feel, I feel terrible doing a shameless plug for this book, but I actually do have a whole list of questions in the back that might actually help. But the, what, the very, the, the easiest answer is also the hardest answer, which is the ways in which we know we're misrepresenting people is, you know, if, if, the more you read and read widely in the literatures produced by the people that you're interested in socially representing, the, the better you're going to be at it. You know, we tend to not read as much as we need to. Um, researching at every single level is really important, but reading the literature, watching the art produced by the very people that you're interested in having this kind of conversation with is fundamental. Not just reading about the people written by, you know, pr predominantly white authors or artists and stuff like that. How do they represent themselves? That to me seems one of the first questions that can be asked and it's a lifelong study. So. Yeah, and I would just quickly add to, I guess, write about your process. I've, been, I've seen works where people who are sort of dealing with this, and this is more in documentary poetics, uh, sort of in the Susan Briante book I was mentioning earlier, but she sort of shares some of the struggles and obstacles she faces as she's going about that process. And sometimes maybe the genre you're working in allows for that, sometimes not. Uh, but I think um, sort of mapping that process and the ways in which you're considering this and also getting some extra readers that you trust that can sort of not give you a pass on what you're writing, but at least perhaps don't see the things that you know you can't see when you're so close to the piece itself. Yeah, exactly.